Amen. Praise the Lord. We're in the Gospel of James, the book of James, chapter 1, verses 12 through 18 this morning. Um, I'm trying to get through quickly here. Uh, you got a roast on and it's set. Hope you've set the cook time. Amen. How many of you set the cook time, right? I don't know how fast I'm going to get through some of this, but here we go. Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away from his own desire desires and enticed right own desires enticed there's two words there that we want to talk about then when desire has conceived it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death do not be deceived my beloved brethren every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation of shadow or of turning and of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be kind of a first fruits of his creation amen what do you think about that text do you like it so, so the thing about this whole reward about in chapter and verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation. I want you to know that most of the time this word temptation, which you'll get through in 13 through 16, is talking about an original temptation that leads to sin. But this particular temptation that in this particular text is talking about the temptation that struggles and uh, things bring into our lives. Uh, situations, uh, you know, and things that are happening, like for instance, if you're sick and you've been suffering with a back for a while, that in itself is a struggle, that in itself is a fight, and what happens is sometimes we just give up. We don't keep focusing in on Jesus and we just give up, and therefore the trials and the tribulation and the persecution that happens to us us, causes us to just give up and turn and not believe that God cares. And this is particularly what in this text the gospel, the, James is talking about. Listen, he says, for when he has been approved, when who has been approved? Those who are being persecuted, going through suffering and tribulation and trials. You know what? That word approved literally means that you are, God is going to put a stamp of approval on you as we walk through this and we keep believing in the midst of those struggles and strife and we keep thinking those things then we just keep saying, Jesus, I don't know what you're doing and when you're doing it. I just know you're doing it. Amen? I don't know why I'm suffering. I don't know why this back will just won't be taken care of because I know you can do it in a moment's notice. Let me give you a personal example that I've suffered just with this whole back thing. It's, it's very interesting because the first thing when you can't get out of bed and you're in constant pain, it takes all that you got to just survive. You're drained. But then on top of that, the enemy comes in the midst of that and and he sends a lot of false testimony to you. He lies to you. He's the he's accuser of brethren. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. And, and, and what he does is he comes through that trial and tribulation. And, and let's not give him too much credit because some of the credit needs to go to us. Because sometimes we just simply are so tired and weary we just don't think God cares. Well, the enemy wants to tell you that he doesn't care. And so in the midst of all this, you have to decide what you're going to do in the midst of trial and tribulation and persecution. Because you're being tested. And there's going to come an approval stamp on you if you just keep hanging in there. I know most of you aren't pastors. But there are some pastors out here who probably can identify with me a little bit. You know, sometimes in the church it's all in a mess. And I know you don't think the church ever gets in a mess. I got that. Can the pastor say amen? <laughs> you say, God, what are you doing? This is your church. And God just says, hang on. I'm working it out, baby. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing in endurance. I'm bringing in some work. I'm going to change the church by persecution, trials, and tribulation. And when I am done and when they have been approved, they're going to be a different church. <laughs> 
We're not going to be a church that's wilting away because of trials and tribulation and persecution. We're going to be a church when Jesus is done with us, no matter what we're facing. Hallelujah. We're going to stand strong in the name of Jesus. We know from experience, for those of us who walked long enough with Jesus, that He is going to get us through this. Amen? Amen. Somebody said to me, well, when you retire, what are you going to do? Pastor, only I won't always have to be up front. That would be amen, Kirby. I'm going to play tennis. I don't play tennis very well, but I'm going to Kirby so he can give me lessons. No, what I'm going to do is I'm still going to follow Jesus and do what he wants me to. I don't find in the Word of God where there's a retirement from being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, I've heard in the past from some of you that your trials and tribulation and persecution, that you have been tempted to think that God doesn't care, that he's not even real. Now, I know you're not going to tell me that, because we, we, sometimes we struggle in the church to be honest with one another, right? But see, that's the enemy and your own hardened heart. That's your own carnality in the spirit of the darkness, because he doesn't want you to think that Jesus is real and that Jesus cares. He wants you to think that this Father in heaven is someone who's way off and can't be touched, and he can't even look at you because he doesn't care. There's a new theology book out. I do not recommend it to you, but I I've read it. It was by one of our theologic uh, theologian in our denomination that now has written this book as God, God can't. And in the midst of that, what he talks about is that God can't overcome evil, that evil has to be overcome by doing good. And the scripture does say that. But what he said is God is linked to this, that you and I have to determine to walk away from evil. There's a couple other things that he says. I don't know if you've read that book, those who like theology. But I've, I, and he says he's linked to earth. That the earth has its own dynamic and its own power and that God cannot change the earth. Well, that's not true. And see, I don't believe that kind of God. I don't like to say God can't. Yeah. Call it my Baptist upbringing. <laughs> Well, we Wesleyans believe that too. We happen to believe that our God through love and through the blood of Jesus Christ has the ability to work in our lives to empower us to live the life that God has intended for us to live. He not only invited us to become a part of Him, but He invited us to have victory over sin. Amen. And we don't have to sin word, thought, and deed, but we can have the power of the living God. That we can live the life that we want. And what is sin anyway? Sin always leads to death. He doesn't say that we're perfect. And when he uses that word, he says, I am bringing about, and this is exactly what this text is talking about, that through trials and tribulation and persecution, God is bringing about the wholeness of Christ into our lives. Yeah. He wants us to be whole, wholly surrendered to him. Thank you. Can you say amen? amen. I, do most, I do pretty well most days to be wholly surrendered to Him until you get on my nerves. Amen. And then I say to God, like one guy said to me when we were in a wilderness trip, and this wrangler did some crazy stuff to me, uh, to us, and, and he didn't do his job. And this evangelist said to me, he said, you know, Steve, and I hadn't even been to school yet, so I didn't have much theology. He said, suppose I kill that guy. You think I'd lose my salvation? I said, I don't know about your salvation, but I know for one thing you'd lose your sanctification. Because you weren't wholly surrendered to God. If you're going to take and kill someone, you weren't wholly surrendered to God. Because what he did is not a life and death situation, right? It was a, just a joke. But I didn't have to walk out 35 miles out of the will hours in the blues. He did. And I'm thinking, you know, I feel like that, right? Murder's always an option. You know what Ruth Bell Graham said about Billy? Someone asked her once if she ever thought about divorce. She said, no, no, not really, but I thought about murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Trials and tribulation and persecution is a big thing for us to understand how God works in them. To, uh, to identify the principles of the kingdom of God. To know that, I want to say this very clearly, we all are going through, will go through trials and tribulation and persecution of some kind. And it will be directly linked to the kingdom's work in us. Because you see, if, if, if James is right, then he's saying that God is allowing this to come into our lives to purify us, to cause us to surrender our lives to Jesus, so that when he comes to get us, we will be approved workmen of God. Amen? Amen. So the next time you face trials and tribulation and persecution, remind yourself that God is in it. Amen. Well, about three of you. Hallelujah. Do not think that God is a God who doesn't care, who, and a God who is not involved actively in your life on a daily basis. Do not believe that lie, for God is actively involved, and nothing comes your way unless God allows it. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about temptation to think there isn't a God. And then he goes on to verse 13. We're never going to finish this because it's time for me to go. <laughs> Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted. <laughs> cannot be tempted by evil. Someone says, well, what about Jesus? He was tempted in every way. Yes, he was, but he was God-man. He came as a Savior, right? He came as a Savior, but there was no sin in Jesus. Jesus successfully, as a man, God came and successfully delivered onto the evil one who tempted him with everything from wealth to food to everything you can say. And God, he said, no, it is written, it is written, it is written. To do the Father's will, or not do the Father's will, but the Lord God Almighty cannot be tempted and will not tempt you and I with evil. Amen. Are you hearing me? I had a young man that I grew up with and he was uh, a mess. He was into everything you can imagine and he was a preacher's son. He was my preacher's son. And he said something to me one day and I'm just a young Christian. He said, you know, I'm into this stuff because I know God's going to bring me out and I'm going to have a great testimony. Amen. No! No! <laughs> God didn't cause you to do evil. You chose that on your own heart, by your own desires, by your own lust was you drawn away. Amen. And then you gave in to that lust and you, the desire became active in your heart. And out of that active desire of that lust became sin. And then sin, by the way, this word sin is not a one-time sin. It's about sinning. And what it says is when you are sinning, it's leading to death. What did Jesus die on the cross for? Amen. Now, I can't get into all the theology about this, but the truth is, when Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, you see His blood covers us. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying if you have issues in your life, you need to take care of those issues. Can you say amen? You need to discipline your life. We'll get into that a little later. But here's the thing about sinning. I'm drawn away by my own lust, by my own desire. And when I give in to that, it becomes so inbred in me because of the carnal nature and the flesh. And this is why Jesus came and died, to empower us with the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can overcome the carnal nature. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. We cannot do this on our own if we could do this on our own, then he wouldn't have sent Jesus. Yes. So stop letting the enemy believe, teach you that you can do this in your own strength. You cannot do this in your own strength. Amen. It has to be a supernatural work of the living God. And God has to be actively involved with you. For you to turn away from sin, Steve, God has to do it in me, and I have to walk in obedience to do that. Amen. Now that is not to say that we don't understand and identify with certain things that we should not do. We should listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, sometimes you say, well, I'll just do this, just this little bitty thing, and God will say through the Spirit, no, don't do that. Right. Why? Because He knows that it's a trap. Yeah. And Satan is not always setting the trap. Our own flesh is setting the trap, because the Bible says that evil, man's heart is evil, no man knows it, how far it is. Oswald Chambers said this week in my devotion, he says, what happens to a man who thinks he's not evil is God will show him how evil he is, right. so that he can bring him to a surrender and identify with the power of the living God. Yeah. Amen? Wow, two verses. <laughs> God does not tempt you. 
the real identification with this whole concept is God cannot, even in the least, be tempted with evil. There's not one evil thing that the Heavenly Father will be tempted with, not even for a moment. You got that? Yeah. I love what the Pope did. Don't tell anybody that. He changed the Lord's Prayer. Oh, that's crazy stuff, isn't it? When it says, lead us not into temptation, he changed it to said, lead us out of temptation. Right? Because, and he said this, his writers said that that lends itself to believe that God tempts us with evil. God does not tempt us with evil. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying the Pope was, well, I'm not going there. I'm an ex-Catholic, so... I'm not saying any of that. I thank God for the Catholic Church. You don't hear a lot of evangelicals say that, but I know the works that they do for men and women who are sold out to be Jesus. I know the works that those who aren't sold out to be Jesus, who are priests and nuns, what they do too, but I also know evangelical pastors who say they're sold out for Jesus, they're caught in the same trap. So thanks be to Jesus for the glory that he does. However, God does permit trials to make us strong. You mean this back thing is a work of the kingdom of God? Possibly. I had a pastor who was in Portland Foursquare Church, uh, Jerry Cook. Great book. He, he writes Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness. If you can ever get a hold of that book, I have some copies. It's one of my favorite books. But in there, he was in this pastor of a huge Foursquare Church in Portland, and he just kept going and going and going, and God kept telling him to slow down, let others take some responsibility, but he just felt like he was the mainstay. Not arrogantly, not prideful, but he just felt like this is what he was called to do, and so he kept pushing himself and pushing himself and then Jerry ended up in the hospital in Portland and as he was laying on that bed the Holy Spirit began to speak to him you think you are so important that I can't do the kingdom's work without you and Jerry I had to put you on your bed on your back in the hospital to get your attention this is not your church this is a church my church this is the kingdom of God this is not your kingdom Jerry this is my kingdom and if you don't quit you're going to die physical death because of pushing yourself and doing things that I never called you to do. And Jerry said it was an eye-opening ministry of the Holy Spirit in his life in that hospital when he realized that this wasn't his church, it was God's church. This is not your life, it's God's life living in you. What does that mean? It means you have to surrender your life to Him. Your dreams, your wishes, that doesn't mean you have to not pursue them. It simply means that God has to be number one in your life. Amen? So many times I hear people say, well, I don't have any money because I didn't save any money and I didn't buy this and do that. Well, that's okay. God's going to take care of it. But at any time, did God tell you to save some money? Did God tell you to buy a house? Well, let's not talk about that. God's going to take care of you? Yeah, He's going to take care of you. But setting priorities and policy in your life is a good thing. Doing good, but not being controlled by them, but being controlled by God is a blessing of the Father. I just read on, on Facebook, uh, no, I don't do Facebook, on YouTube this week about this man in, in Singapore. He's 20 years old. He's a billionaire over 12 times. He gave his heart to Jesus Christ and he said to this person, they asked what was important to him. And he, he this is a public testimony. He said, money is not important to me. He said, wealth, possessions, and material things are not important to me. I thank my Lord for them. But he said, the most important thing for me is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. He said, I can, I can live without those other things, but I can't live without Jesus. He's 20 years old. He's in Singapore. I don't know if you know much about Singapore. A lot of wealthy people in Singapore. And he's 20 years old. His brother is 24. They are believers in the Lord. And they are out proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this guy's a billionaire. And someone said to me, well, yeah, let him give that billionaire to me. Give me a billion. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's going to change him. 
When someone says to you that he loves Jesus, and Jesus is the most important thing, and having a personal relationship with Jesus is what matters more than anything, that's a pretty powerful statement. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. Should take that to the Bill Gates and uh, Warren Buffett and uh, Jeff Bezos, Bezo, whatever. <laughs> Jeff B. Let's just call him Jeff B. Jesus, you have the greatest gift of everything. Your gift from Christ is worth more than anything else in your life. It's worth more than all the money you can have. And sometimes we just need to live that way, and God cannot be tempted. One last text. Got, we got time for one last text? But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. And, I want to tell you something. Here's a, here's a beautiful picture of what he's talking about. You can check this out just to make sure I'm right. It's like the fisherman who's fishing on the river. And he baits his hook with a bait that he's going to put in front of that fish's mouth. And they're going to hit it because the bait is enticing. What James is saying is the enemy of your soul begins to bait and entice you with things that you don't even understand. But you're tempted and you begin to be drawn away by your lust. And Satan is constantly trying to entice God's people to walk away from him in sin. Bait. Well, that bait's not working. You haven't caught any fish. Let's change it out. Let's go to the wiggle work. I don't know. Someone said to me once, he said, what are you using? I said, I have no idea. It just works. Yeah. Satan knows exactly what bait to use yeah. in each of your lives. He knows what will entice you. That's why the kingdom of God and his word says that we begin to develop in our heart and mind to put on the mind of Christ. To hide his word in our hearts. To, to dwell on the pure things. Because God knows that we need to be redefined by the power of the word and by the power of truth. So that we can stand in, in the midst of that temptation and say no. Yes. What bait? What bait is the enemy or your own flesh using to tempt you so that you can be drawn away by your lust? And then once you're drawn away and enticed, you begin to fulfill that desire. What is he using to entice us? This is a different temptation than what 12 says. This is a temptation of fleshly desires and lust. It can be money. Most of the time when we read this and we think about it, we think of sexual temptation. But sexual temptation is just one part of temptation. There are other lusts, pride, ego, wealth, power. Oh boy, let's not talk about that. Pray a long time, will you humble Washington, D.C.? I heard someone say this week that the problem with Washington, D.C. is we got too many people who want absolute power in the Congress and in the Senate, and they're not willing to humble themselves and do something good for the people and to work together. And I thought that that goes from the White House. Oh, did I say that? They go, God, bring us some leaders. Now, and I said, but you do know God has his leaders in Washington, D.C. Right. He has his men and his women who love him and are trying to follow um, him in, in those halls of Congress and the Senate and in the White House. I didn't say President Trump. Although I do believe God has his hand on President Trump. He, he says that. So I'm praying, you know, I'm praying he'll get saved. Amen. Mightily saved. Amen. Powerfully saved. Okay, moving away from politics. What's the problem with the border? 
The problem with border is we need godly people to give some direction to us to fulfill the needs that we have and the responsibility that we have as a country to meet the needs of these poor people who are coming in. But by the way, not all of them that are coming in are poor people. We need someone with wisdom and knowledge to discover and decide. We spend billions and billions of dollars on equipment from the military. How about we spend some money to build some facilities where we can have some judges and we can have some people that will meet these guys, find out if they need to stay or find out if they need to go back and take care of the need. How about if Congress decides to do something and fix the situation? You know what's happening in Texas? There are churches, all brands of Christianity are working together to give needs to those families that are caught down there. All you ever hear is what's happening. But I'm telling you, God's kingdom is at work in Texas. I don't live in Arizona. I haven't heard much about that. But in Texas, churches are coming together and making sure these folks have needs. You know, we have immigrants here that came from places and got into America. We have them right in our congregation. And what would it have been like if they said, no, you can't come in when they needed to come in? When, when they ha Do you think most people do not want to leave their country? They have to for uh, lots of reasons, right? Guatemala. Okay. Temptation. <laughs> What is God baiting you with? What is God enticing you? When I was a young pastor, one of the things God uh, allowed me to go through is this worship war. People were saying, I don't like this song, I don't like that song, and so I decided I was going to just do whatever I felt I needed to do. And so, boy, did I make a mess of it. And then I just prayed, Lord, have I can only use who you send. I can only use the people whom you send to me. And so I began to pray a different prayer. God, would you send me a worship leader? Would you send me someone? And um, my wife was a worship leader for most of the years of my ministry. And thank God for her because she's got a beautiful voice. If I led worship, I'd probably never had a second church. But being enticed by the enemy, I wanted to be, I wanted to have success. I wanted the largest church in the, in the district. I wanted to have people growing. I wanted to do, and I got so hung up with that, that I was being tempted and drawn away by my own arrogant pride until God one day reminded me, just like he did Jerry, this is not your church. This is my church. Relax. Every Sunday I'd go and look at the offering and I'd say, God, you got to give me more money. <laughs> God says it's not your business. That isn't to say that I don't preach on tithing. That isn't to say I don't believe in giving. It's to say that it's my business. Relax. It had killed me if I'd have kept in that home mission church finding $800 a month when the bills were $1,400 a month. It had killed me. As it is, my wife would probably say it almost killed her. Right? But, but I just finally one day I just said this, and this is a beautiful example of what we need to do in temptation. We need to surrender to Christ and not let the bait that Satan or our flesh puts in front of us. We just say, okay, God, deliver unto us the power of the kingdom. We surrender to you. And I said to him in my office, oh, man, I am, I just realized I had to make the bulletin with, what do they call those things where you pour the ink in and you had to, wow, I am getting old. Do you, uh, you know, what is, what's it called? Mimeograph. I got ink on my hands, on my Bible. I, and I had to type it. And I didn't type very well. Every Sunday, it's funny, every Sunday people come, hey, you know, this is a misspelled word. I said, I tell you what, here's what we're going to do. Every misspelled word, count how many there are, and the one who comes up with the accurate number, I'll give him a reward. <laughs> but I gave it to Jesus. I gave it to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. If you don't think I'm being tempted in my older days, you better be mistaken. But I'm trying to figure out what bait the enemy is using in my heart and in my life so that I know that it's coming and so that I can stand strong in the presence of Jesus Christ. What does this have to do with you today? What does it have to do with me today? It's a very practical situation to know one. That you are, when you are under trials and tribulation and persecution, God is at work and God has not left you. And God is using those things and allowing those things to come in your life to bring you to a place of perfection. 
What does that word mean? That word means maturity. Uh, that word means uh, completeness. That word means to be walking in obedience. And God is using struggles and strife and tribulation to bring you away from yourself and your own pride into a place where you are totally surrendered in Jesus Christ. Secondly, what He's doing in our lives is He is telling you that I don't lead you into wickedness. I don't lead you into evil. In fact, what I do is I allow things to come into your life so that you will walk away from evil. Thirdly, He's telling you that when you do commit evil and you sin against the Father, because that's who you're sinning against, that you have been caught in a trap and that you have been enticed by the bait that the enemy or your own flesh has had. And what you have to do is figure out what that enticement is and ask God to cleanse you and heal you and set you free from that. If you have the meat hook of Satan in you and every time you try to get victory and he keeps coming back to the same thing, that's because you have a hook in you and Satan has power. You need to rebuke that in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and take the meat hook out of you so that he no longer can drag you around by the same thing time after time after time. So that you can have freedom in Christ Jesus. Now don't get me wrong, Satan doesn't take his hat off and he says, okay, I lost that battle, I'm over. No, he comes for an, un, uh, an, for an unopportune time to tempt you again. When Satan was done in the 40 days of the wilderness, it says Satan left him and the angels came and ministered to him. What does it say? It says that he, Satan waited for another opportunity. Another opportunity. Satan's not going to quit, but in Jesus we can have authority and we can have power over that. What does it have to do with me? It has everything to do with me. I have to learn how to discipline my body and make it in the subjection. Paul says, I beat my body. Do you know he says that? The good I want to do, I don't do. The evil that I don't want to do, that's exactly what I do. And he says, in the next chapter, he says, who shall deliver us? And he says, thanks be to Jesus, because Jesus delivers us. Paul says, I beat my body just like a runner, just like a marathoner, just like a boxer, whatever you want to use there. But I make my body do what I know it needs to do by the power of the Holy Spirit, which literally means in the last thing, don't ever do this, my professor wouldn't like this. We have a responsibility to discipline ourselves to live the holy life. I don't care what name you have on you. It's about Jesus. It's not about the church of the Nazarene. It's not about your church. It's about the church of Jesus Christ. And He ignites fires in us to live the life He calls us to live. Hey, uh, could you help me today, brother? Because I am so tempted. What are you tempted with? You really want to know? Can you handle it? Can you handle it? If I didn't think you can handle it, I wouldn't call you. When was the last time you were honest with someone that you trusted and you said to them that I am sorely being tempted with anger? I'm sore, sorely being tempted with lust of the flesh, or lust of the bank, or lust of anger, or, or I, just, I just don't think God cares. When was the last time you called someone and said, I need your help? I need you to pray for me. I bet, I don't know how many of you have told me this last two weeks that you were praying for my back. I can tell you, I can tell. I can tell. I, I'm telling you, I can tell. Don't stop praying, but let me pray for you. Amen. Um, Someone said to me a couple weeks ago, I just can't seem to get victory. No matter what I try, no matter how hard I try, I can't seem to get victory over this. And I said, perhaps you're trying too hard. Perhaps you need to just give up. Confess it to the Lord Jesus and say, I cannot overcome this without you. Amen. And then let Lord, Amen. through the Holy Spirit, teach you how to overcome that. Yeah. 
I said a couple weeks ago to, for you to call and ask my wife how I'm doing. Anybody call my wife, ask her how I'm doing? Or why don't you wait another week? <laughs> and not just like it? And I said, nobody knows that, but here's the reason. I know that accountability is part of walking in the kingdom of God. I know that being honest with people is part of my victory. So in the end, church, let's just be honest with each other. We all are sinners saved by grace. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Yes. The next time you see someone on the street that's astray, just remind yourself that because of the grace of God, He has cleansed you and he is, you're no longer lost. You've been found. But I'm telling you, God wants to send victorious people out into the streets with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to make a difference. Are you wanted to be one of those? I do. And I know to get where I need to go, I got to go through a lot of stuff. I'm a stubborn, strong-willed man. Don't tell my wife that. Wait a minute, she already knows that. But I'm stubborn against God. I don't like what you're doing. I don't like not being able to walk. But you know what, Lord? I can't heal myself. That's right. But you can heal me. And so I just give it over to you. Right? I already got a story for the surgeon. I'm going to say, well, you know, God has healed me. Two weeks ago, I couldn't walk, but I'm walking into your office. Amen. Right? How about if you just give me a shot of steroids into my, into my, can you, my doctor, last doctor I visited, he said, you know what the problem is with you, Steve? You come in here telling me what I need to do. <laughs> He said, and then you only wait about every year and a half before you come into my, my office, and then you, I don't even talk to you about some things because you got the answers. <laughs> that humbled me. But then he gave me 100 pills of, of pain pills. <laughs> Why didn't you just give me five? Even the pharmacist said to me, you got 100 of these things? I said, yeah, I need, I need to make some money. <laughs> He looked at me and he says, uh, we're not going to be able to feel that. <laughs> he said, in fact, what we're going to have to do before we fill that prescription, you're going to have to call your doctor because it's got a red flag on it. <laughs> no, I said, you know, the reason my doctor gave me that is because he knows that I don't take that stuff and I resist it all the time. So he trusts me. <laughs> but the pharmacist said to me when I said that to him, he says, well, I don't trust you. <laughs> He said, so we're going to have to check that out. So you know what I did? I pulled my, my prescription out of Walmart, and I went to Costco, and they just filled it. Yeah. Costco's a cool thing. <laughs> and, uh, but I, as I was taking that medication, <laughs> in conclusion, that's the first one, I realized that the medicine was helping a little bit, and it got my inflammation down and the pain under control. And then at about four days into that, I realized it wasn't helping me anymore because too much of a good thing can become a bad thing. And so what I did is I quit taking that meds and I got better. I was able to walk and do things. I still have them in case the pain gets out of control. We don't want the pain out of control. But on the other hand, Jesus is a good thing and you can never get too much of Jesus. But what we do is we reject Jesus and we walk away. And when we do that, what happens to us is we get bound by all kinds of stuff that we never even thought we could get bound by. I have Christian friends who are right back where they were when, before they got saved. They're doing the same things they did before they got saved because they were told a lie and they believed the lie that God didn't care and God couldn't deliver them and God couldn't help them. And they're right back where they are. That breaks my heart. My heart is sorrowful. Sin never is good. Find out what's enticing you and ask God to remove it in Jesus' name. Amen.